Dr. Edie Witter is a biologist and a deep sea explorer who combines expertise in oceanographic research and technolog technological innovation with a commitment to reversing the worldwide trend of marine ecosystem degradation, which is very on point with the aquarium's mission, of course. We're very excited to have her. She started her exciting career here in Massachusetts by graduating from Tufts University, where she received her Bachelor of Science in Biology, then went on to earn her Master's degree in Biochemistry and a PhD in Neurobiology from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Her research involving submersibles have been featured on the BBC, PBS, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic. A specialist in bioluminescence, which we're going to hear a little bit more about this evening. She has been a leader in helping to design and invent new submersible instrumentation and equipment to enable unintrusive, unintrusive uh, deep sea observation. In 2005, Dr. Witter found the Ocean Research and Conservation Association, or ORCA for short, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the protection of marine ecosystems and the species they sustain through development of innovative technologies and science based conservation action. In 2006, she was awarded the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship for her work with ORCA. Besides being an author on 75 peer-reviewed scientific publications and a featured TED Talk speaker. Dr. Witter has produced a fabulous children's book on bioluminescent, the bioluminescent coloring book, which will be for sale after the lecture. So we're very excited. Thank you, Gina. It's a great pleasure to be here and talk to you about my favorite subject to talk about, which is bioluminescence, the animals in the ocean that make light. And I'm going to be telling you about how they make light, and why they make light, and where they make light, and some of the ways that their light has been useful to humans in the past and now in the present. So I got hooked on this subject uh, when I got a remarkable opportunity to make a series of dives in this diving suit uh, called the WASP. And it's called WASP not because that's an acronym. Uh, exactly somebody thought it actually looked like the insect with the yellow body and the bulbous head. It was actually developed for use for diving on offshore oil rigs down to 2,000 feet in the ocean. Uh, and I got to be included with a group of scientists that were testing it for the first time as a tool for ocean exploration. Diving in WASP completely changed my understanding of the nature of life in the ocean. It also changed my understanding of the expression colder than a witch's tit. <laughs> because the deep sea is quite cold and that is a metal suit. So you will note there is a wool sweater there and gloves and a hat. I think it was Jerry Seinfeld that talked about the fact that you lose 80%, I think it is, of your body heat through your head, which makes it sound like if you just had the right hat, you could ski naked. <laughs> a hat helps but you still come up feeling pretty cold after a five-hour dive. And I would come up with my teeth chattering and my lips blue. And there was this old oil rig, rig diver that was in charge of the dives named Charlie. Grizzled little guy. And Charlie finally took pity on me and he pulled me aside and he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Look, well, I'll let you in a little secret, but you've got to promise not to tell these other guys. I said, Sure, Charlie, what is it? Pantyhose. <laughs> which is kind of like silk underwear, you know, in that extra layer of warmth. But I was never sure which kept me warmer, the pantyhose or the vision in my mind of Charlie wearing it. <laughs> so my very first dive, I, I was trained in a tank in uh, Port Wainimi, but my first open ocean dive was in the Santa Barbara Channel. It was an evening dive. I went down to 880 feet, and I turned out the lights. And the reason I turned out the lights is I knew I would see this phenomenon called bioluminescence. Now, what I would really love to do is be able to take you all on a dive with me to be able to see what it's like. So to do that, first of all, I'm going to have to train you all to be wasp pilots. So the first thing we're going to have to do is get into the beast. So you're looking down the throat of the wasp, the, the plexiglass hemisphere that you look through has been folded down here. And you're looking down into the base of the suit here, and down at the bottom of the suit are what are known as foot switches that control these thrusters. So if you're going to fly WASP, you, know how, you, you need to know how to control the, the foot switches. So if you want to go forward in WASP, you tilt both feet forward. If you want to go back, you tilt both feet back. If you want to go to the left, tilt both feet to the left. Want to go to the right, tilt both feet to the right. Got it so far? Yeah. Okay. You want to go down, tilt both feet in. 
like you're pigeon toed, right? And you want to go up, you tilt both feet out. Okay, we're ready to dive. <laughs> so first you got to get in, obviously. So what they do is they put a piece of uh, plywood across that that you can sit on, and then you climb in backwards. And that's a younger, thinner version of myself crawling, crawling into wasp. So you slide in um, and down past all of the gauges and switches and stuff. And then once you're inside, you go through your final checks. You're the pilot. It's your job to make sure everything's safe. And um, this is uh, Dr. Bruce Robeson, who was the chief scientist on this mission. You can see he was a little better built for this suit than I was, because really it kind of takes um, a lot of muscle strength to be able to, to use those arms. And I actually lifted weights for a year to qualify as a pilot. And one of the things I had to do to qualify as a pilot is I had to be able to do up a shackle underwater. And it turned out my biggest problem was my arms were too short. Uh, so I had to figure out a way where I would you know, take one arm out and the other arm and I would just use the ends of my fingers to be able to turn the, the um, screws that control the, the claws. And I'd have to go back and forth and back and forth. It took me about an hour to do up this one shackle underwater, but I got it done. Um, on the other hand, I had a big advantage over Bruce and the other guys because I had a lot of extra room in there. And in fact, one time when the suit, uh, the, one of the foot switches jammed and the suit was going backwards out of control, I discovered that I could actually turn around inside the suit and disconnect the cable that went to the power box. And if that had happened to Bruce, I'm not sure he could have even gotten his arm behind his back to be able to do it. So there were certain advantages. Okay, so if you're going to pilot this thing, the last thing you check before they seal you up inside is that O-ring seal right there. You want to be real sure that that's very clean. Not any dust or dirt on that that could allow water to seep inside. So once you've given the go-ahead, they close up the hatch, seal you up inside, and then they lift you off the deck with the, the strength member that is also the, the power cable and communications cable. Uh, and lift you off the back of the deck. And now you kind of see what the suit looks like. Now, you, there's no legs for walking on the bottom. This is a mid-water suit. You just fly it around with these thrusters that you now know how to operate with the foot switches. And there's these Michelin man arms with the claws on the end of it. And here we are, slipping beneath the waves, saying goodbye to the world we know. And then down around 20 feet, the scuba divers would come down and attach all of the gear that was needed in order to be able to do um, the science that we wanted to do down there. And at that point, now we're ready to go on the real dive. So as I said, my first dive, I went down to 880 feet and I turned out the lights. And I turned out the lights because I knew I would see bioluminescence, animals in the ocean making light. I didn't discover it. It's been known since ancient times, as we'll be discussing in a minute. But I just was completely unprepared for the extent of it. No amount of reading could have ever prepared me for what I actually saw. I saw chains of jellyfish called siphonophores longer than this room and pumping out so much light that I could read the dials and gauges inside the suit without a flashlight and puffs of what looked like blue smoke all around the suit and blue sparks that would swirl up out of the thrusters, just like when you throw a log on a campfire and the embers swirl, swirl up off the campfire, only these were icy blue embers. Absolutely breathtaking. I just couldn't believe how fantastic this was. I've been completely addicted to it ever since, and I've been studying it for the rest of my life. Now, usually if people know about bioluminescence, it's these guys, fireflies, and there are a few other land animals that can make light. But in general, the, the animals on land are few and far between. There's earthworms and centipedes, and there's a, a, a land snail, there's some millipedes, there's some, actually some fungi that can make light. But in general, it's really, really rare. In the ocean, nothing could be further from the truth. If I go out and I drag a net in the open ocean environment away from shore from 1,000 meters, 3,000 feet to the surface, almost anywhere in the world's oceans, most of the animals I bring up in that, make, that net make light. In fact, in many places, 80 to 90 percent of the animals in the net make light. The fish, the shrimp, the squid, the jellyfish, they're all light makers. It's, it's just unbelievable. So how do animals make light? Well, 
obviously they don't light a match or they burn up, right? And we tend to associate heat and light, but there are other ways that you, that you can make light. And um, actually, let me back up for a minute. What I'd like to do is show you another way to make light with a little help from maybe some of my friends here. And, and uh, Sage, you want to come up and help me here? Okay, so we're going to get the lights down. If we could get the light, get it dark in here, if you guys want to come up here. So you guys know light sticks? You know how these work? Okay, so when I count to three, everybody's going to break the light stick. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait until I say. Okay, and turn around and show the audience can see. Okay, can we have the lights out? Lights out. Okay. <laughs> no, why this one won't turn off? Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay. One, two, three. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Bend it hard. Bend it hard. Harder, harder, harder. Bend it over your knee. <laughs> no, no, he can do it. He can do it. Put your thumbs on it like this. Get some leverage. Break it as hard as you can. There's a glass. I can do it. <laughs> Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Come here. <laughs> Okay, so is there any heat coming from it? Um, no. All right. No. Shake it up. Shake it up. So you're mixing the chemicals inside and hold them up above your head so everybody can see. And depending on which chemicals you mix together, you can make different colors. And the animals can make different colors. Now, you're going to get these back at the end of the talk, but I'm going to hang on to them for now. <laughs> A lesson I've learned the hard way. <laughs> okay. I once, I once uh, tossed them out. I had a, a very large audience, and so it was just easier. I just tossed a few of them out so that they could then pass them around and, and see for themselves that there's no heat coming from them. And for the rest of the talk, they were just going across the <laughs> flying them. Very, very distracting. <laughs> um, so so you, can, you can make light by mixing chemicals together, and that's what the animals do. But the chemicals that the um, animals use are called luciferins and luciferases. And that comes from this original experiment, experiment that was done by the French physiologist Raphael Dubois, who wanted to know why, how this clam makes light. And so um, it's a boring clam. And I should point out that it is not a dull, boring clam. In fact, anything but. It's actually a rock boring clam. That's why it's called a boring clam. Um, and he. Uh, ground it up with cold water um, and did a hot water extract and he found that if he put those two things back together he could make light again. And he figured that the cold water extract must be the uh, uh, heat labile protein with, or the enzyme which he called luciferase and the hot water extract must be the stable uh, substrate which he called luciferin um, after lucifer the light bearer. And that terminology is stuck, but it does tend to cause a little confusion because people think when you're talking about luciferin and luciferase, you're talking about specific chemicals. In fact, it's just a generic term. In fact, there are many different chemicals. And you don't have to have had organic chemistry to look at these and say, okay, these are very, very different chemicals. And, you know, this is the firefly, this is jellyfish, earthworm, um, bacteria, the only freshwater example of luminescence known is a limpet from the streams of northern New Zealand, uh, a sea fireflies, and um, dinoflagellates. If you are an organic chemist, you might actually recognize that as looking a lot like chlorophyll, and it's thought that dinoflagellate luminescence actually does derive from chlorophyll. So where do animals make light? Where do you see the light from animals? Well, it's actually been seen by navigators since ancient times. And some of those ancient navigators, um, oh, hang on a second. I did that in the wrong order. OK, so um, I did want to show you what bioluminescence looks like, first of all. And so we have some bioluminescent critters hiding in the dark here. 
And so we're going to have to get the lights turned out again, now that you've got that figured out. Did it. Yes. All right. So I've got a, a container here that is, um, I'm going to put my, oh, thank you. Um, and there's no light coming from it right now because they need to be disturbed in some way. But I, it's filled with bioluminescent plankton, so hopefully when I shake it up, you'll get to see what bioluminescence actually looks like now that you're fully dark adapted, I hope. <laughs> that is bioluminescence. And you'll know each time I shake it, it gets a little dimmer and a little dimmer because these are living creatures. And they're using chemicals just the way those light sticks were. Those light sticks are made from man-made chemicals. These are animal-made chemicals. Um, and they're, but they're using them up. Okay. So one way you can see that, one place that you can see that, um, is in surface waters. And so you can have surface waters that are filled with bioluminescent plankton like that. Um, and that one that you just saw was uh, a dolphin swimming through bioluminescent plankton. Um, and that wasn't someplace exotic like one of the bioluminescent bays down in Puerto Rico. That was actually filmed in San Diego Harbor. And there are other places around. I mean, we have, uh, there have been uh, dinoflagellate blooms, plankton blooms off the coast here. Um, where you can see really brilliant displays such as that. Um, and not only just dinoflagellates, this is the dinoflagellate that I just shook up for you, but uh, copepods, which are so prevalent, they look like the insects of the ocean. Krill, which are so common in the ocean that they are the food source for baleen whales. All krill are bioluminescent, with the exception of one fairly rare species. Um, jellyfish, a lot of gelatinous zooplankton are bioluminescent. And then these sea fly fireflies called ostracods, uh, they're about the size of a tomato seed, but they can produce a crazy amount of light. And so the um, ancient Polynesians were very familiar with bioluminescence. Now, the ancient Polynesians were amazing blue water sailors. I mean, they covered huge, vast oceans of the Pacific, pinpointing these little tiny islands in, in with no GPS, obviously. <laughs> and, and, uh, but they did it in a variety of ways. One of them was uh, they used stars, sun, and prevailing winds and swell. That one you can, you can kind of easily imagine. Another one is that they would follow the uh, known uh, paths of migratory birds. So for example, they knew that the long-tailed cuckoo migrated from Tahiti to Hawaii in September. And so they could follow. There used to be so many birds that they could actually follow them um, on their migratory paths. They used clouds and wave patterns near islands that would kind of widen the field of view um, to be able to enlarge the target, as it were, so that you would have clouds over an island. You knew you could see the clouds in the distance that, that there was an island there, or you knew by the wave patterns. And they also had dogs. Uh, that they called moi moi that were trained to bark when they smelled lamp. They had one other way of uh, navigating, and it's called telapa. And it was passed down as an oral tradition, and it, there are still some Polynesians alive today that can read telapa, but we as scientists still don't know what this really is. They call it underwater lightning. They describe it as streaks, flashes, and momentary glowing plaques of light that dart out from the directions in which islands lie. Occurs anywhere from a foot to more than a fathom beneath the surface, and it's usually seen in the middle sea, 80 to 100 miles out. As you approach land, it becomes scanty and finally disappears. It's correlated, the speed is actually correlated to the distance offshore. So, you know, one hypothesis is that these are internal waves that are stimulating the luminescence, except that we don't know of any kind of luminescence that would be stimulated by internal waves. But clearly, these ancient Polynesians knew about this. I actually got an invite um, recently that was terribly tempting to me. It was There is a woman going out with some of the Polynesians on, on some of their positions. <coughs> but I would have had to go out for three months to do this. <laughs> And it was, it was just kind of a crazy idea, but I would still really, really love to know more about this phenomenon, because it's clearly bioluminescence, and it's a kind of bioluminescence that we don't understand. Now, usually the way we find about, out about life in the ocean um, is we go out with 
boats such as this one, and we drag nets behind those boats. And I defy you to name any other branch of science that still depends on hundreds of year old technology. But that is, in fact, the case for most of marine biology. Most of what we know about life in the ocean depends on net hulls such as this, as this one. And you end up with a, a sample like this that really doesn't tell you much about real life in the ocean. It tells you what's there to some extent, except, of course, all the stuff that can outrun a net that you're not going to know about. But it certainly doesn't tell you anything very significant about distribution patterns. Well, here's another case where bioluminescence has proved very useful. So this is a technique uh, that I originally developed using this little single-person submersible uh, and then have adapted to other subs, and it's been adapted by other people on other platforms. And what it consists of is using a screen in front of the submersible. Um, this is the Johnson Ceiling submersible, and out in front of it is this screen that's three feet in diameter and inside the sub with me is this intensified camera, about as sensitive as your fully dark adapted eye. So what you're about to see is what bioluminescence really looks like in the deep ocean. And you turn on the lights, turn off the lights, turn on the camera. That sparkle <coughs> is just the electronic noise. You don't actually see bioluminescence until the sub starts to move forward through the water. But when it does, animals bumping into the screen are stimulated to bioluminesce. And you can start to see how much luminescence there really is. Now this was actually uh, recorded in the Gulf of Maine, where I've done a lot of work, down at a depth of 730 feet, I think it was. And when I was first doing this, all I was trying to do was count the number of sources. I knew my forward speed, I knew the area of the screen, and based on this I could say how many hundreds of sources there were per cubic meter at a particular depth. But over the years, I've been able to start identifying these animals by the type of displays they produce. So for example, that is the display of a little comb jelly, a tinafore, that releases these luminescent particles as a form of defense, just the way a squid or an octopus will release an ink cloud. And so I've now worked with computer engineers, uh, and we have adapted this into a program that we call the Spatial Plankton Analysis Technique, which has the acronym SPLAT. Um, <laughs> and uh, we can now uh, identify animals by the type of displays they produce, and then extract the XYZ coordinate of the initial impact point and create these reconstructions that allow us to do the kind of um, ecology that um, scientists do on land where we can do nearest neighbor distances and figure out how animals are distributed in the ocean. So for example, here in the Gulf of Maine, this was in a thin layer uh, near the surface of a uh, bioluminescent copepod. Um, this was in the uh, temperature minimum zone, and the green dots are dinoflagellates. There's a few copepods mixed in there, and this is a, a krill, a euphausid, that's glowing. And then down near the bottom, there were some of these tinafores that released these luminescent particles. So why do animals make light? Clearly, a lot of them do. It's apparently evolved many different times. In fact, based on the, the chemistries and some of the, the physical structures, we now believe that bioluminescence is evolved at least 40 times, separate times in evolutionary history, maybe as many as 50 times. So it's clearly very, very important to their survival. Well, one of the ways that they use light is, is to help them find food in dim light environments. And so you have animals like the flashlight fish or the pine cone fish that they have on display here at the aquarium. And they have these built-in headlights that they use to help them find their food in the dark. This fish has a headlight behind the eye. This one in front of the eye, high beams. This one has three different headlights of different colors. And different color depending on, um, these are the high beams. So most of the color in the deep ocean is this. And that's because Seawater acts like a filter. It filters out all of the reds and the oranges and yellows. This is the color that travels furthest through seawater. You know that if you've ever opened your eyes underwater. Everything looks blue. So most of the animals have evolved the color that's going to travel furthest. So they emit blue light, and they can all see blue light. And in fact, most of them are monochromats. They can only see blue light. But this fish is different. Not only can it see blue light, it can see red light 
and it emits red light. So it uses its bioluminescence like a sniper scope to be able to sneak up on animals that are blind to the red light and see them without being seen. Very, very cool adaptation. This also has a little luminescent chin barbel that it can use as a lure. And a lot of these animals have lures. And we know about lures thanks to uh, Finding Nemo, which showed this anglerfish, which a lot of people didn't know anything about anglerfish, but they have a luminescent lure that they use to attract unsuspecting little prey that come to nibble on it and then find themselves engulfed in this living mouse trap of needle sharp teeth. Now, I do like to point out that those are not the eyes of a real anglerfish. Those are the eyes of an anglerfish that's been preserved in formalin. These are the eyes of a living anglerfish. And she's got a lure here that uh, is used to attract food, but it may be used for something else because here's another anglerfish. She's got a lure with all these interesting little threads coming off it. Now we used to think that the different shape of the lure was how um, they attracted different types of food sources, just the way a fisherman will use different lures depending on what they're trying to catch. But turns out these fish all eat pretty much the same stuff. So now we believe that the different shape of the lure is how the male identifies a female of his own species. Because in the anglerfish world, the males are what are known as dwarf males. This little guy has no teeth for eating, no lure for attracting food to him. All he's got is a couple of big eyes that he's got to use to find himself a babe. Because his only hope for existence on the planet is as a gigolo. <laughs> he's got to find himself a babe, and then he's got to latch on for life. So this little guy has found himself this babe, and you will know that he's had the good sense to attach himself in a way that he doesn't actually have to look at her. <laughs> but he knows a free ride when he sees one, and so he has sealed the relationship with an eternal kiss. His flesh grows into her flesh, her bloodstream grows into his body, and he becomes nothing more than a little sperm sack. I'll leave it to your own personal interpretations of what that means in the larger scheme of things. But I should tell you that she does not have to be monogamous. This is a species that she's got two males attached, and I believe that the record is eight males attached. Because either some women are greedy or some women are martyrs, depending on your point of view. So you can use bioluminescence to help you find food, to attract a mate, and you can also use it for defense in a whole lot of different ways. Um, I'm only going to talk about a couple of them. One of them is you can use it just the way a squid or an octopus will release an ink cloud. A lot of these animals can release their bioluminescent chemicals into the face of a predator. So this shrimp is actually spewing bioluminescence out of its mouth like a fire-breathing dragon into the face of this viper fish, temporarily blinding it while it pulses away into the darkness. This fish does the same trick. This fish is called the shining tube shoulder. And um, I was lucky enough to capture one of these. I was a, um, a consultant on the Blue Planet, the deep portion of the Blue Planet series. And for that, we were on a trawling expedition off the northwest coast of Africa using a very special, very large net with a thermally insulated um, closing device on the end of it that allowed us to bring up the animals alive. So we brought up this fish alive, and I brought it into the lab on the ship. And when I did, all I'm going to do is touch that tube on its shoulder. And when I do, it squirts out luminescence. But oh, it's a crazy oh. amount of light. And it's even crazier because it isn't just the luciferin and luciferase that this fish is squirting out. It's actually whole cells with nuclei and membranes. I mean, it's very energetically costly for this fish to do this. And we have no idea why it does it. It's got to have some really interesting natural history that maybe somebody in this room will someday figure out. Here's one. This fish has all kinds of light organs. It's got a, a, a light organ to help it see in the dark. It's got a chin barbel to help find food. It's got a bunch of light organs on, it, on its belly that it uses for a type of camouflage. But a lot of these animals, we use every light organ they've got in something that's called a burglar alarm. And a burglar alarm is the same reason you have a 
a burglar alarm on your car, the honking horns and the flashing lights are meant to attract attention and scare the burglar away because he doesn't want the attention. It's basically a scream for help. All of that light is meant to attract attention of a larger predator that may come and attack whatever's attacking the fish and thereby afford the fish a chance for escape. And there's a lot of animals that do this. Now we were lucky enough to see the burglar alarm on this fish because we didn't catch it with a net, we caught it with a submersible. So uh, this was off of Cape Hatteras, this fish swam by. Turns out the top speed of this fish is one knot, which is the top speed of the submersible we were in at the time. So we had to chase it for a long time. But boy, was it worth it, because we caught it, we brought it up into the lab on the ship in basically pristine condition. Everything on this fish lights up. It's, it's belly lights, it's fins, it's flashlights under its eyes, even the chin barbel is flashing. And all, all in synchrony, and it's a scream for help to attract attention to something bigger that will come and attack the scientist holding it by the tail. But I mean, you know, if it were down there in the depths of the ocean and something had a hold of it, um, it would attract a lot of attention. That's the concept. Now, this is a jellyfish that does the same thing. This is a very common deep sea jellyfish. Um, and we caught it with the submersible again, once again with a capture device that barely touches it. And it's kind of like a cylinder that uh, with sliding lids on it. And so we're chasing it, and now we're going to bring it up into the lab on the ship. And to get the display you're about to see, all I did was touch it once per second with a um, dental pick, which is sort of like the sharp tooth of a fish. And, and then once I stop, it just keeps producing this pinwheel of light. And it's really an impressive amount of light. And I've done calculations that show that that could be seen from as much as 300 feet away by a predator in the deep ocean. So I thought, you know, that actually might make kind of a good optical lure. Because one of my frustrations as a deep sea explorer is I've always wondered how much is there down there that we don't know about because we've been scaring it away. Because as I said, most of what we know about life in the ocean comes from nets. Well, an awful lot of things can outrun nets. A friend of mine says that nets only capture the slow, the stupid, and the greedy. <laughs> the greedy because of the net feeding. Um, but um, So these are the, the platforms I've used the most. The Johnson Sea Link um, the, and these two robots with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, the Tiburon and the Vantana. And they're um, great platforms, but I've always, as I've been sitting in the JSL, wondered, you know, how many animals are there out there beyond the range of my lights that are looking at me, but I can't see them? Because they're not going to come close enough because we're scaring them away. These are, these are bright lights and noisy thrusters. And I, they are very noisy. Are we hooked up to the uh, audio right now? Oh, don't worry. No, it's not worth it. Um, I, I was going to, the, the point is that I kind of had the impression over the years that I see more from the JSL than I do from the Tiburon, and I see more with the Tiburon than I do with the Vantana. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. So I can I can show you I um, demonstrate what these sound like. So that's what the JSL sounds sounds like. It's an electric, um, and it's very quiet. And so it kind of makes sense that I've I've seen as much as I have from it. Um, the Tiburon is also electric, not quite as quiet as the JSL. I've lost the link for some reason. And then the, uh, the Vantana is hydraulic. And almost all the ROVs now are hydraulic because that's more powerful. And we've lost that link too. Interesting. Okay, well, I'll, I can show it to you later if you're interested, but it screams. It would make you want to put your fingers in your ears. It's, it's, it's so loud. So it's, it's got to be scaring these animals away. So I thought, well, how could we explore without scaring the animals away? So I got this idea for a camera system called Eye in the Sea. And it, the idea of putting a camera on the bottom of the ocean that was battery powered and just leaving it there was not a novel concept. A lot of people have done it. But I wanted to make it unobtrusive. I wanted the animals not to be disturbed by it. So I went back to that fish I showed you that uses red light and thought, OK, let's use that. 
Now, using red light, you know, they use infrared light to look at nocturnal animals on land. You can't do that in the ocean because infrared light is absorbed so quickly by seawater. And it turned out to be very tricky to find just the right wavelength of light um, that where we could see the animals, but they couldn't see us. Um, the other part of this that turned out to be very tricky was getting it funded, um, because there's this little trick in science where they won't give you the funding for something until you can tell them what you're going to discover. And that was kind of the point. I didn't know what I was going to discover. So um, the original system, I actually got the Harvey Mudd Engineering Clinic to do as an undergraduate student project, and we kind of gave them the bits and pieces, and they got something that was sort of working on a bench top. And then I got the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to pay for the underwater housing in this frame that holds the red light up there. And I got the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, where I'm an adjunct, to pay for the battery and for some of the early tests of the system. So, uh, but you can see just what a shoestring operation it was, because this was the optical lure, which was the 16 blue LEDs that were embedded in epoxy, in epoxy. But you can still see the word Ziploc in the, uh, the, the mold that we used to, uh, to create this. So we call this thing the electronic jellyfish. And the first time we got to test it was um, on a mission in 2004 to the uh, Gulf of Mexico, actually very close to where the oil spill eventually happened, sadly. And so we put this thing down. It was definitely a kludge job. Uh, but we had it largely working. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see what an operation it was to, to get it down there. So we brought it, we bring it down with the Johnson ceiling. And we left it by a place on the bottom of the ocean that was kind of like an oasis where I thought a lot of large predators might be likely to um, patrol. See, that's actually made out of an old aluminum ladder. That's just, this, this was, this is sometimes how science gets done. Um, and especially when you don't have NASA's budget. And so this was, um, one of our early recordings, there's a fish swimming towards the camera there. And it doesn't look very exciting. Maybe you want to dim the lights just a little bit if you can. Thanks. Um, so, but I was thrilled. I mean, I was ex beyond ecstatic because I had my window into the deep sea. And I could tell that these animals were not being disturbed by our camera system. So I had about four hours of data like this. And I thought I couldn't be happier. But it turned out I was wrong because four hours into the deployment, we had programmed the electronic jellyfish to come on for the first time. 86 seconds after we turned it on for the very first time, we recorded this. This is a squid over six feet long that is so new to science, it cannot be placed in any known scientific family. On the basis of that, I went back to the National Science Foundation and said, this is what we will discover. And they gave me, <laughs> and they gave me a half a million dollars to do it right. <laughs> so uh, part of doing it right involved um, make, developing the world's first deep sea webcam, which was installed in the Monterey Canyon for about a year. Um, and I just want this is, this is some of the data from, from that webcam. Uh, these, this is the electronic jellyfish being attacked by a juvenile Humboldt squid. And we have about 26 attacks like this. So we have pretty good evidence that this is a, a pretty effective optical lure. Now, the point is that that's supposed to be a burglar alarm, right? Which means that the, the squid should be coming in and trying to attack whatever's attacking the jellyfish. And Bear it just seems to be trying to attack the jellyfish. But we also have attacks like this. Of course, this may be the Einstein of squid we've got going here. But um, this guy comes in and goes, now wait a minute. There's supposed to be something else here that's attacking that jellyfish. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> and he's persistent. He comes in. <laughs> pulls back, thinks about it some more. There's got to be something else here. I just know it. Maybe if I come in from a different angle? <laughs> nope. <laughs> so I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, this isn't being generally made public yet, but I'm going to be part of a giant squid hunt off of Japan this summer, and we're going to be yeah. using that same optical lure to try to lure in giant squid. And you may be seeing it on television next year, or not, <laughs> as the case may be. 
And sometimes we lured in other things. Um, this is a different, uh, this is just a glowing source that sort of imitates a certain type of uh, display that um, is typical of a uh, dead ball on the bottom. And that is a giant six scale shark that was um, interested enough that he proceeded to try to eat the entire eye in the sea and his electronic jellyfish. Actually, we have we have a lot of footage like this now. Um, we used to when we first started putting the eye in the sea down on the bottom of the ocean, um, we would sometimes come back and find it. it had been moved from where we left it, and we kept thinking that fishermen had snagged it or something. And but now we realize it was being moved by six feel sharks. There's there's actually quite a few of them down there when you're not scaring them away. So my um, response to this was, you know, that there's so much in the ocean yet to be discovered. And yet it's so alarming to me that we're actually destroying the ocean before we even know what's in it. And, you know, we live on this ocean planet. It's a huge, huge volume that we're talking about here, but we're actually having unbelievable impacts on it. Part of this, it, it, um, you know, you think about the, the surface of the Earth being 71% water, but that's just surface area. If you think in terms of the living space on the planet, what's known as the biosphere, you're talking about a living space that's almost 99% of our biosphere is our ocean. So how could we be having the kind of impacts we have? It's, it's incomprehensible. But in the last 50 years, we've wiped out 90% of the big fish in the ocean. And, and by the year 2048, I think it is, there won't be any wild fish left in the ocean if we keep going the way we are. At the same time that we're fishing out these fish, we're, we're destroying the habitat. So this is a bottom trawl system. These are rollers that roll in front of the net that cause the shrimp and the bottom fish to jump up and go into the net. But what happens is you take a beautiful little garden like this and turn it into a, a wasteland like that, or like this. You know, deep sea coral reefs off Florida have been turned into moonscapes. For one haul of shrimp or bottom fish, it's completely unsustainable. It could take hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years in some cases, for this to regrow. And there isn't any habitat down there, so it's not being supported. So it's equivalent to what we've been doing to the rainforest, but it's going on underwater, so most people are completely unaware of it. One thing that you can do, and I'm very, very serious about this because it really does make a difference is in the choices you make. And I'm sure the aquarium has seafood watch cards, right? You guys have them. Okay. Take your seafood watch cards. Take them with you. Give them to the restaurants you go to. Insist that they buy the right, they not sell fish from the avoid list. The avoid list is, is things that are being overfished, like swordfish and um, bluefin tuna. They're just being wiped out. And if we give them a chance, they can come back and we can eat them again. But we just have to, you know, be careful. And of course, then you might also want to carry these with you for your own sake because all of those little asterisks there are telling you that you shouldn't be eating them because of the mercury that's in them, the toxins. And, you know, there's more and more cases of people getting mercury poisoning from eating too much fish because we've got so many toxins now um, accumulating in these top predators. The other problem we've got is, is as I say, these, these pollutants. Now, in the early 60s, with the formation of the environmental movement, which was triggered by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, it was also triggered uh, the, by this picture, or one like it, that ended up on the cover of Tide magazine of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catching fire. This river was so polluted, it oozed instead of flowed, and the oily pollutants that floated on the river would routinely catch fire from the late 1800s right up until the 60s. But that picture on the front of Time magazine was the trigger for the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA came in and they cleaned up all of our point source pollution problems. They shut down the factories that were pouring their waste and their filth directly into our waterways. But we still have polluted waterways and that's because of non-point source pollution. So that's the pollutants that run off of our cropland, you know, pesticides and fertilizers, animal feedlots that, that allow animal waste into our waterways, deforestation, you end up with just sediments coming into the water, which doesn't sound so bad, but even 
uh, particles, you know, sediment particles can be damaging to the gills of fish. Uh, homes that have leaky septic systems, a toxic cocktail of uh, hydrocarbons and um, uh, pollutants that run off of our roads um, and parking lots. And by the way, this is going to come back to bioluminescence in a minute here because this is an application of bioluminescence that we've recently developed. Uh, algae blooms are one of the results. This is from the nutrient loading. Red tides, algae that are producing toxins that, that cause fish kills. Off the west coast of Florida, we've had red tides so bad that they've impacted real estate values in the tourist industry because the red tides aerosolize their toxins. Nobody wants to be next to waterways that make their eyes run and their throats sore. And we've got animals showing up with tumors. This is a turtle covered with tumors. And this is from our own backyard in uh, the Indian River Lagoon. These are a resident population of dolphins from the southern part of the Indian River Lagoon that are covered with a flesh-eating fungal infection called lobomycosis. Now, if you know anything about dolphins, they have exquisitely sensitive skin. This must be so excruciating for these animals. There was a story during the Gulf oil spill of a dolphins that were being burned by the oil in the water. Their skin was, was burned. And this one dolphin came up along the side of a fishing boat. And the, when it exhaled, it blew oil out of its blowhole onto the people in the boat. And the, the fishermen who'd been taking the people out there um, for decades said he'd never seen anything like this, but he kept moving off from this dolphin and the dolphin kept following him. And he said he felt like this dolphin was asking for help. And I think these animals are asking for help. Now, as a marine biologist, I get a lot of young people coming to me and saying they want to be a marine biologist and I ask them why. And they say because they love dolphins and they want to swim with the dolphins. <laughs> I said, well, you know, if you love dolphins and you really want to help dolphins, the best thing you can do is clean up their water because they are suffering because of uh, dirty waters. And these are sentinels. They're telling us about that, that there are things here that we need to be worried about. This type of fungal infection actually occurs in third world countries and people can get it. We're also losing a lot of firstborn baby dolphins. The mother offloads her toxin load onto her firstborn. So when, by the time she's reached her reproductive years, she's built up a big toxin load. She offloads it to the firstborn through her blood and her milk, and the firstborn baby dies. <coughs> After she's offloaded it, then the second and third um, babies have a much better chance of survival. So a lot of these things were the, uh, what led me to start the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. We're on the east coast of Florida in uh, Fort Pierce. Um, and uh, our focus has been on developing technological solutions to ocean conservation challenges. And one of those has to do with making pollution visible. Because a lot of this stuff is going on out of sight and out of mind, and people aren't aware of it. And so we've been focusing on a way to make it visible. And when you talk about water pollution, an awful lot of water pollution ends up in the sediments. And that's where it has its longest residence time. So when you're trying to figure out where the pollution is, one thing you do is you go out and you take a sediment sample. Well, then you send it to a lab. And what do you test for? There's literally hundreds of toxins now released into the environment. So I figured, well, you know what we need here is the equivalent of a canary in the coal mine. So for the younger people in the audience, uh, we used to not have sensors for the poisonous gases that coal miners have to worry about when they're down in the mines. And so what they would do is they would take a canary down with them because the canary was sensitive to a whole range of the different gases that they had to worry about. And they knew if the canary stopped singing or worse killed over that they needed to get out of there fast. So the canary is what's called a broad spectrum bioassay. And so I figured that's what we need for measuring toxicity in our sediments, is a broad spectrum bioassay. And so what we've settled on is bioluminescence. So I told you we'd come full circle. So we use bioluminescent bacteria. Um, and bacteria are different than the things that I just shook up for you, the dinoflagellates. And the bacteria glow all the time. And they glow all the time because the bioluminescence is linked to the respiratory chain, basically the breathing of the bacteria. So anything that interferes with that interferes with the light output. So you have this really quick, simple, cheap assay for toxicity. And so we use that to go out and we map different areas. So each one of these is a dot that where we've taken a sample. And um, red is very high toxicity. Blue is no toxicity. Um, and this is the Indian River Lagoon, and as it happens, this is the region that those um, dolphins that I told you about live. 
And so we've got a serious toxicity problem right down here, very near where the dolphins uh, live. And it turns out that that comes from something you may have heard about in um, the uh, newspapers about what's been done to Florida and to the Everglades. And this actually links to the Everglades problem. So this is Florida and this is Lake Okeechobee and these are the Everglades down here. And the way Florida used to be is the Kissimmee Valley River used to feed into Lake Okeechobee which would overflow its southern banks into the river of grass and you had this amazing ecosystem. Well then Army Corps of Engineers came in and carved up the um, interior of Florida and created uh, canals to carry the water to Miami, diverted it from the Everglades, but they also dammed the southern end of Lake Okeechobee so that it couldn't overflow its banks, but when it gets too full, they sh shush the water out these canals, including the C-44 canal, and this is of course what they're claiming is going to be the future, but I've been hearing that for a couple of decades now. Um, but what that means is that there's no biological filtering. And so what's actually happening is those dolphins are being made sick by mercury that is coming out of Lake Okeechobee. And actually, it's coming from air pollution. Air pollution uh, settles mercury everywhere, but we get normal biological filtering in most places and it, it deals with it reasonably well, but because we just have these canals in Florida where there isn't healthy biological filtering, we're getting this mercury coming down into um, the waterways where the dolphins are, and so they're making us sick. So this is another application of bioluminescence, and it's another application of the fact that everything's connected. We live on a water planet. All of these waterways are connected to each other in various ways, and we have to learn how to keep our water healthy. And for ourselves, for our children, and also, we also want to be able to share just the beauty of the ocean. And with that, I just want to close with um, this sequence of some of the bioluminescence down in the depths of the ocean. This needs to be on everybody's bucket list. And it's not impossible because now uh, they're starting to create tourist submersibles. They're, they're pretty cool things. Um, and you know, if you ever get an opportunity, please, please take the, take the plunge and make sure you ask them to turn out the lights because it's just spectacular. And by the way, for the teachers that were here this afternoon who I was talking about pyrosomes too, that's a pyrosome. And um, another common bioluminescent jellyfish. And then uh, it finishes here with the, uh, the atola that does that, that pinwheel display, which I just still takes my breath away. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much.